Well, regardless of whether your performance is record-setting, you might think you have much to be grateful for as an investor this year. Top executives at many of the scandal companies have been indicted, and some are in prison. The Sarbanes-Oxley law imposes tough requirements for better financial reporting and corporate governance with jail time for managers who don't comply. New York Attorney General Elliot Spitzer has forced the mutual fund industry and Wall Street analysts to clean up their acts. It all sounds so encouraging, but in truth, you're not nearly as safe as you may think. What are the new ways you're being ripped off? Which slimy practices still haven't been exposed? And what can you do to protect yourself? Maggie Mahar is a longtime financial journalist and author of Bull, A History of the Boom, which Warren Buffett has recommended. She joins us from New York. Edward Sedell is a former SEC enforcement attorney who now helps companies and investors spot fraud and abuse. Ted, after all we have been through these past three years, there are still mainstream players on Wall Street, and I don't mean the marginal guys, the bucket shops and so forth, I mean mainstream players on Wall Street who are not being absolutely fair with investors? Absolutely. Very little has changed actually over the last couple of years. The brokerage industry mm -hmm. is still being allowed to self-regulate, self-adjudicate, self-insure, and even control public access to the criminal and disciplinary information regarding uh, its membership. So that hasn't changed. And so investors are still being abused, ripped off? S the investors are still getting only a small portion of the disciplinary information available about the brokerage industry. So they're being misled into thinking that it's that doing business with brokerages is far safer than it in fact really is. Uh, Maggie, let's talk for a minute about mutual yeah. funds and uh, that industry. A lot of people after Elliot Spitzer had a uh, very showy uh, uh, bunch of uh, uh, accusations about the uh, fund industry and after a big settlement, a lot of people think, well, it must be pretty well cleaned up by now. Do you think it is? I'm afraid not. Conflicts of interest are still huge, and one of the biggest problems is that mutual funds continue to pay brokerages to recommend specific funds. So when your broker recommends a fund, it may well be because his firm was paid to push that fund, and you're not told that. Um, there's talk about disclosing which funds are paying to have their funds recommended and how much. Even if it's disclosed, though, do you really want your broker recommending a fund because they've been essentially paid a bribe to do so? Probably not. You want him recommending a fund because he thinks it's a very good fund, he thinks the price is right, it's a good time to buy it. So this whole notion of revenue sharing, as they call it, or funds paying brokerages, really undermines the whole fiduciary relationship between broker and client. Ted, is this something that the SEC or somebody like that ought to do something about? Well, the SEC claims it is doing something about it. They claim that they banned directed brokerage program, directed brokerage practices, but the fact is they aren't really doing anything about it. Right. And, and the biggest uh, indictment of the mutual fund industry to me is you know, how many mutual fund uh, companies have fired their advisors in the last two years? None that I'm aware of. Right. So that must mean they're all doing a terrific job. How many mutual fund companies have voluntarily cut their advisory fees? Only one that I know of, Fidelity, has temporarily done so on one of their index funds. How many mutual funds have significantly reduced the brokerage commissions they pay to brokers, which has always included a marketing component? The answer to that, again, is none. And have they changed the brokers they're directing the majority of their commissions to? Again, no. So I think the answer is nothing has changed. Maggie, you were going to say something about whether this is something the SEC should do something about. One problem um, to doing anything about this is the fact, as the brokerage industry would point out, since fees were deregulated and since discount brokering came into being, it's hard for brokerages to make money just on the fees alone because the commissions we pay are much lower than we used to. So they say we have to make money somehow. And unfortunately the way they make money often involves a conflict of interest between their responsibility to the investor and their responsibility to themselves or their own shareholders. And this is the ubiquitous problem whether we're talking about mutual funds or stock research or pension funds or anything else, the right? Big, Undisclosed conflict. The biggest uh, lesson to be learned in the last few years has been that anybody who purports to offer objective advice probably isn't. 
most uh, providers' objective advice have been corrupted because there's far more money to be made providing tainted advice. Most people are going to think that this was fixed, right? That th this was, the, this was the, the crux of all the, not all, but of many of the scandals of the past few years. They're going to presume that this has now been fixed. Maggie, you were going to comment on this. I was just going to say, the only place you're likely to get objective advice is if you're paying for re research, and probably paying quite a bit. Um, there are research firms, boutique firms, that aren't in the brokerage business, that aren't in the business of selling you anything, that are just doing research. But as I said, that research is usually fairly expensive. Ted, for a lot of people, their biggest investment actually is in the form of the pension fund that is through their employer or through their union or something like that. So if that pension fund is getting ripped off, they themselves are getting ripped off. And I gather this is a problem? There's not a pension fund in this country that has in place the procedures to detect and prevent fraud. I, this is what I do for a living, and I've seen the largest funds, CalPERS, to some of the smallest mm -hmm. funds, simply do not have procedures in place. So pension funds are being ripped off, and there's a lot of self-dealing going on. For example, in products that simply make no sense, like variable annuities, including in a, you know, charging four and a half percent in some cases to 403B and 457 plans. It's virtually impossible to accumulate wealth over time in a plan that's charging fees of four percent. Well, it would be almost impossible. A fee that high is going to wipe out any differential above the market. You could hope to get almost ever and you have found that there are plans with expenses this high sure huge ones the new york state yeah. united teachers endorses an ing variable annuity product for their 403b and 457 plans this is analogous to a 401k but it's in an organization like that yes and the fees on that product are i believe two and a half percent the the ohio association of school business officials they have a product same ing product that is endorsed by the association and that charges fees up to three and a half percent plus you have brokerage and other costs that bring it over four and these unions are getting paid by these insurance companies or these variable annuity companies to promote the product in the case of the new york state united teachers they're getting paid in excess will get paid in excess of three million dollars in two thousand and five to be to endorse the product and promote it among its membership. Maggie, this was the kind of thing that happened for one thing in the Enron case when people were shocked to find that an awful lot of the Enron pension fund was invested in Enron stock. And that, That's right. that one instance I know enraged so many people that I've got to figure most Americans believe that has been remedied in some way. It has not? No, it has not. The only way to remedy it is for individual investors themselves to realize that it's not a good idea to have your savings in the same place where your job is. And talking about corporate fraud, you know, at the very beginning of the program, you mentioned Sarbanes-Oxley, which certainly sounds like a tough law. Executives can go to jail for up to 20 years. How many executives have actually been sentenced to jail? Very, very, very few. Um, the people from Adelphi, who were relatively small fish, Mar Martha Stewart's in jail simply because she's a celebrity, had nothing to do with corporate fraud. Well, and that wasn't under Sarbanes-Oxley anyway. That's right. But what I mean is that people, CEOs who do commit fraud, don't go to jail. The right ex executives are an exception to that. But by and large, the company pays a fine. The company subtracts that fine from their corporate income tax. It's worth, it's part of the cost of doing business in the minds of many executives to game the numbers. And so they continue to do so. Now we've got some big trials coming up. We have um, en the Enron trial with Ken Lay and Skilling. We've got Scrushy from Health South. We've got Bernie Everts from WorldCom. It'll be very interesting to see what the outcome of those trials is. How can investors protect themselves, Maggie? What can you do? Because it's clear that the laws, the reforms aren't doing the job. What can you do for yourself? That's right. Well, first, let's look at mutual funds. What you can do for yourself is look for a fund, and this may mean going to a Morningstar, a Lipper, look for a fund with a long track record, ideally more than 10 years. We know the studies show that track records of three, five, six years aren't very meaningful in terms of telling you about the talent of the manager. So you want to look for a fund that has a longer track record with the same person managing it, and then you want to look at 
not just what, how he's done on average, but you want to look at his performance year by year. In other words, if this guy has made 11% on average over 12 years, that's nice, but does that mean that he had two or three very lucky years when he made 29%? Or does that mean that steadily he was making money over time and losing very little money? And that's the kind of steady long-term performance you're looking for. In other words, you want a manager who takes a long-term view of things. Ted, let me ask you something, because some people in business are contending that uh, enforcement of these new rules has become too vigorous and some of the lobbying groups are actually campaigning quietly but campaigning for Bill Donaldson the chairman of the SEC to be moved out of that job because they say he's pushing too hard they have a point oh not at well they have a point the point is that, that that the regulatory environment has or pendulum has been swinging against them but we haven't even begun to enforce these new rules that have just been put on the books and by the way, I, I would disagree with Maggie in a few respects. I, I would caution people, especially about Morningstar. Morningstar is not, in my opinion, an independent rating organization. They, they earn fees from mutual fund companies, and they are very much involved in promoting the sales of mutual funds. And as you may recall, very soon after some of the mutual fund scandals at MFS and elsewhere, within months, Morningstar said the scandals had been... 25 years of scandalous behavior had been cleared up. It was now safe to get back in. Morningstar has had a very poor track record at predicting mutual fund scandals and has, um, uh, therefore, I think, should be very much discounted when they say that mutual fund companies are clean. I just want to say one thing about Morningstar. I differentiate between Morningstar's columns and Morningstar's stars and the information you can get if you go deep enough on Morningstar. When I wrote the book, I interviewed Don Phillips, and he said, anyone who just goes on Morningstar and looks at the first level of information is making a mistake. You need to go down and check some of the things I was talking about earlier. It has the same person been managing the fund for a period of time? How has he done year by year? How has he done in hard times as well as good times? That information, that raw data that you can get on Morningstar is very useful. But I would agree that these star systems have all turned into marketing tools and so you have to be very wary of of the stars of what you see in mutual fund ads and the way in which these ratings are used um, I entirely agree about that again it's the point anybody who purports to be offering objective advice should be viewed with great suspicion well, let me ask you this then can you trust anybody well I would say that given human nature when individuals are entrusted with substantial assets that don't belong to them there is a propensity over time to convert those assets to the advisor's personal use so i think whenever it comes to handing your whenever you hand your money to someone else you should always continue to be suspicious of what's going on constantly monitor can i ask you who manages your money I actually have my money entirely in Berkshire Hathaway Class A. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> so you know who's managing your money. I know. You who's know exactly my who's money. managing and it. And it's, it's, it's my personal uh, preference, but that happens to be where I have it. Look, this has really been interesting, and the bottom line advice is pretty clear, which is watch out for yourself at least as much today as you ever did before. Ted Sedell, Maggie Mahar, thanks so much. Thank you.